Síguenos para más información relacionada con hormigas y no olvides suscribirte. Hola a todos, eh, muchas gracias por estar acá presentes. Eh, de nuevo, eh, muchas gracias Brandado por las palabras y muchas gracias a todos por el homenaje que hicimos. Eh, vamos a seguir con la charla magistral del doctor Till Barden. Eh, una breve eh, como presentación del doctor. Él, él es eh, egresado de la Universidad de Arizona State, donde hizo el bachelor, el, el, el pregrado en biología. biología. E hizo el doctorado en el Museo Americano de, de Historia Natural, el AMNH. Eh, con David Grimaldi y hizo posteriormente su postdoctorado en el Rutgers University. Muchos de ustedes lo conocerán como el, 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 como el nuevo paleontólogo de hormigas, el que ha descrito las famosas hormigas del infierno, las aeromilmicinas. Y hoy nos va a hablar un poco de la evolución de las hormigas y cómo es el estudio de la evolución de las hormigas puede ser utilizado para entender procesos macroevolutivos y microevolutivos. Entonces, sin, sin más, doy la palabra al doctor Barton. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, champion. I have to say it's sort of hard to follow Professor Brandau. This is a, <laughs> a very exciting. I mean, I can remember reading so much of uh, his work throughout graduate school and of course now um, and yeah, it just uh, Really great to <laughs> to uh, see some of that uh, this honoring of his work. Um, so I want to say thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you all here. I was looking at the program and the breadth of work that's going to be covered from ecology to even pollinators, um, you know, taxonomy of ants, biogenetics, systematics. It's really exciting and impressive. Um, my talk is going to kind of cover a few things that maybe are outside of some of the work that, that people do. And so I hope it's more than anything fun and interesting, um, maybe hopefully informative, but at least fun. Uh, so as we all know, ants are very diverse. They uh, have this sort of rich morphological diversity. So there's about 15,000 described species on our planet today. Um, and along with those named species, there's a variety of morphological features and phenotypes that uh, are quite dramatic in the, to the extent to which they vary. Um, so much so that these are all genera that just begin with the letter A, which I'm sure are familiar to many of you. If we look beyond the morphology, we also can observe a rich ecology and, and diversity in behaviors that these animals also exhibit from um, non-destructive cannibalism and um, amblyopone ants to Azteca ants nesting in cercopia trees to Acropaga ants tending mealybugs. Um, and one of the features that I think makes ants also very exciting and interesting is the ecological pressure that they exert on environments. Um, and one of the best ways I think to visualize this is through ant mimics. And so of course on this screen are a variety of other arthropod lineages that have independently adopted ant morphology and in some cases even chemical cues. And this is in an effort to either blend in to exploit colony resources or to avoid predation in most cases. And I think this is a nice way to see the ecological pressure that ants exert. And that's, of course, because they are highly dominant in terrestrial ecosystems, especially in the tropics. Um, so on the right here is how many of us, I think, see the planet today. And it's worth asking, well, what did it look like maybe 50 million years ago and 100 million years ago? And what can we learn about the history of this lineage over time? The way that we traditionally do this in systematics is we might assemble features, either morphological features or um, DNA molecular features for different species or lineages. And then what we'd like to do is reconstruct their evolutionary history through a phylogenetic tree. And so what you're seeing here is a simulated phylogeny and I've pruned this phylogeny to just living species. So there are no extinct tips or extinct species on this simulated tree. But if we see that same topology, that same phylogeny, but with all of those extinct lineages included, we can see that what we see today is just the very tip of the evolutionary history of what's happened in ants, right? And this isn't true just with ants, it's true with any lineage. And occasionally, occasionally, we may be very lucky and we may actually recover evidence for one of these extinct lineages. Um, for example, here, um, a fossil from the Dominican Republic, which might be closely related to a living species that we have today. So it's not entirely surprising, although it's important to think about how fossils can change our reconstruction of evolutionary history. 
At the same time, they can also change our understanding of how ecosystems evolve over time. So here, what you're looking at is a map of the distribution of apis, of honeybees across the planet. And in red is apis mellifera, you know, the introduced domesticated European honeybee. And if you really just looked at this distribution on its face, just the species that are with us today, you might presume that the only reason that honeybees are in uh, the in North America are because they've been introduced by humans. But if we turn to the fossil record, we can observe that there are in fact fossil apis in North America from the Miocene in Nevada in the United States that are dated to about 15 million years ago. And so if you're trying to reconstruct the history of pollinators in North America, and you don't necessarily include this fossil, you may be missing a part of the rich history of pollinator diversification over time. So all this just to say that extinct species or lost branches can dramatically reshape reconstructions of evolutionary and ecosystem history. And we learn about those branches through fossils. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So I'm gonna to talk to you about three things. One is the ant fossil record and the earliest ants. Two is an extinct adaptive radiation of a kind of exciting group of ants from the fossil record. And then lastly, if there's time, we'll talk a little bit about an extinction um, at an ecosystem level that we're using as a case study in my lab that Jean-Pierre is actually working on. Um, so there's about 800 described fossil ant species across 80 deposits around the world. And that's surprising to most people because that's about equal to the number of described non-avian dinosaurs. And more than half of those species are preserved in fossilized resin, which is termed amber. And a remarkable feature about fossilized resin or amber is that it preserves the animal in three dimensions with very high resolution and very high accuracy. So we can extract much more phenotypic information from animals that are trapped in amber. Um, we can get amber all around the world. This is some field work that I did quite a while ago in India that I like to show because it makes me look really tough because I'm standing up high on a cliff. But what you can't see is there's a road actually just half of a meter underneath me. So I'm actually not up very high, but it makes me look very much like an explorer, even though I'm not necessarily one. Um, so here in India, this is an active lignite mine that's being mined to fuel power plants. And within the lignite, we can actually find pieces of amber. This de particular deposit is dated to about 54 million years ago. And that's just one of many deposits around the world. There are others that are um, not included on here, but what I've done is I've just included uh, some of the deposits that have yielded fossil ant species. And if we take those deposits, there's about 80 here around the world, and we overlay them on a geological time scale, we can see that the oldest fossil ants that we know about, the oldest definitive ants are about 100 million years in age. Um, and then there's a pretty long gap between about 78 million years ago to about 55 million years ago, where we have no fossil record. And if we compare that to molecular divergence estimates, um, those estimates uh, suggest that ants diverged from their closest living relatives somewhere between 165 million years ago in the Jurassic to about 110 million years ago in the Cretaceous, depending on the assumptions of these analyses. One interesting thing that we can do is if we compare the number of ants relative to other insects in each of these 80 deposits, um, we see something interesting, which is first, that ants never make up more than 1% of insects in amber or any deposit um, during the Cretaceous from about 100 to 78 million years ago. When the fossil record picks up again and we have our next well sampled deposits, the number of ants that we see actually increases by an order of magnitude up to about 30% um, in the Miocene of all insects or arthropods in amber. And so this is kind of interesting if you start to think about the ecological pressure that ants are starting to exert on ecosystems, right? Um, and we're starting to think about this in kind of fun ways in my lab. For example, here, this is a phylogeny of uh, mammals, and all of the, the branches or the tips that are labeled in orange are ant or termite feeding mammals. So ant, you know, lineages that are obligate eaters of ants and termites. The majority of their diet comprises those different social insects. And if we overlay the uh, abundance or the increase in lineages of ant and termite eating mammals over time, we can see that it closely matches the pattern that we see in the ant fossil record. And another interesting side note is that a similar pattern is also observable in, in termites. Termites also got their start in the Jurassic, but never really increased into abundance until the Cenozoic after the KPG extinction event 65 million years ago. 
So in my mind, when I think about the ant fossil record, I put it in two halves. One is before dominance. So these are the earliest ants when ants are much more rare than they are today. And then the other half is after dominance. And this is where the majority of fossil species and specimens are known from. And so to start, we're gonna talk about BD, these earliest ants. So the earliest ant fossil record actually starts here in New Jersey, about 30 minutes from where I'm standing now. It's a short drive. And some fossil hunters were walking along the beach and they found a piece of amber. This amber is dated to about 92 million years ago here in New Jersey. And they sent it off to uh, Ed Wilson who does what he likes to do. And he turned it into the cover of science in 1967. And the reason why this was the cover of science is because it was the first ant from this time period. Until, him, until this time, um, the oldest ant fossils that were known were only about 30 or 40 million years old. And so here we have an opportunity to compare predictions of what we might think ancestral ants would look like. And the exciting thing about this fossil is that it demonstrated that those predictions were pretty close to what that fossil actually exhibited. So it's this sort of generalist um, mixture between ant-like features and other non-ant solitary wasps. But there was some recent evidence or uh, increasingly recent evidence that that wasn't the entire picture, that this generalized fossil wasn't really the only thing going on. And the first evidence of this really was in 1996 when uh, Dulesky, who's a Russian paleoentomologist, described this specimen from uh, Burmese amber dated to about 99 million years ago. A really remarkable thing about this particular specimen is it actually was collected by TDA Cockrell and deposited in the uh, British Museum of Natural History in, you know, like 1920 or 1930, and it wasn't described until 60 or 70 years later by Dulesky. And you can see here the really strange thing about this animal is it has these scythe-like mandibles, these tusk-like features that hook up towards its own forehead. At the time, if you read the literature, some people were kind of skeptical and thought maybe it was preservational because there really was just the one specimen. Um, and that was the case until 2008 when um, Vincent Parashow and colleagues described a similar taxon from uh, Cretaceous Amber in France. When I was a graduate student at the Museum of Natural History, this is around 2010 or so, um, one of the first specimens I was working on was this specimen of Burmese Amber that was donated at the time. And a sort of exciting thing that was happening is that we also had new access to X-ray imaging techniques that were kind of new to paleoentomology. And so we took that specimen and we put it into a CT scanner and were able to produce this three-dimensional reconstruction of what we now call or Hadomermex scimitaris, which is, uh, this particular specimen is a de-alate. So this was a queen that had shed her wings. And here you can see these side-like mandibles um, are not preservational, they're, they're definitive. And we actually use them to reconstruct what we think was the hypothesized mouth movement for this animal based on these elongate CD that were present on the head that we interpreted as trigger hairs, as well as the morphology of the animal overall. And so the, actually, Hadomermex and Hadomermesines in general are just one of many Cretaceous lineages that we now know about. And one of the first things we wanted to know is how these earliest ants are related to modern lineages. So whether it's Fecomerma, which is kind of generalized, or Hadomermex, which is unusual, um, are these members of living lineages? Are these maybe very old ponorines? Are they distributed among modern subfamilies? Or did they diverge from modern ants prior to the last common ancestor of modern ants. What that would mean is that essentially it would be analogous to non-avian dinosaurs and birds, right? Are these more like the Tyrannosaurus rex than Velociraptor of ants, or are they just ancestors of ants that we have today? So through some kind of basic phylogenetic work, we reconstructed a phylogenetic tree and found that um, these ants actually comprise what we call stem group ants. And this means that they diverged from modern ant lineages prior to the last common ancestor of all living ants. So that means they have no descendants. There are no lineages today that are descended from any of the animals I'm about to talk about. And so they're entirely extinct, just the same way that Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor, those lineages of theropod non-avian dinosaurs are all extinct. So we're going to talk about one specific example of those. Sorry, I'm getting requests to admit people to the room and I'm trying to do it so that, <laughs> that way nobody's stuck outside. Um, so we used that CT scan to reconstruct what we thought was kind of the most exciting animal, um, or at least I thought was the most exciting animal I would ever work on, which is Hadomermex scimitaris. 
And uh, it turned out that that was really just the first step in a long series of steps to figuring out what's going on in this group. Um, and the nice thing is that this group has attached, attracted some public attention. And so some artists that are really great at reconstructing extinct animals have turned their attention to these. So here you're seeing um, this artist named Franz Anthony, who reconstructed this beautiful um, Hadamarmic scimitaris de-alate. And because we got kind of tired of in papers saying these you know, animals with dramatic side-like mandibles that hook up towards their own forehead that are from the Cretaceous. We took that genus name, the type genus for hadomyrmicines that Dulesky described, which is hadomyrmex, and we shortened that in English uh, to hell ants. Hado is in Hades or the underworld and myrmex is in ants. And so we commonly, and I'll, I'll refer to them throughout the rest of the talk as hell ants, that's how we call them now. And I thought, again, that would be the coolest thing that I would ever work on. And it turned out that it was not anywhere near that so a few years later, Vince Parashow and colleagues described this ant, uh, Ceratomermex ellenbergii from 99 million year old Burmese amber. So here you can see this elongate horn that's actually erupting out of this animal's forehead. So you have these side-like mandibles as well as this horn. Um, so here are some other uh, angles of this particular example here. Um, next, we have lingual mermex, which is a species we described the year after that, also from Burmese amber, that has this paddle-like lobe erupting from the forehead and these side-like mandibles. And in some cases, the amber can be really clear, but in other cases, it's kind of hard to see what's going on without a clear visual. And so we started here at the university collaborating with some undergraduate industrial design students who basically sculpt these in three dimensions. Um, these students will probably end up working on movies or something, but they spent a little bit of their side time uh, playing with us on these ants. So they basically just made these models from scratch using CT scans or just images of hell ants. And so here you're seeing Hadomermex, Linguomermex, and Ceratomermex all side by side. Um, just a few years ago, we described a few other genera of hell ants. Same similar features. We have these side like mandibles and something weird going on where you have a projection, this horn like projection coming out of the head. So this is um, a genus called Chanidris. Here's another called Protoceratomermex, which is my favorite, it has this very tiny little uh, horn and these really stubby mandibles. Here, this is a genus called Aquilomermex, so it has this elongate snout-like protrusion coming out of the head and these same scythe-like mandibles. And then finally, Dagnathos, which is this really dramatic uh, genus that has almost like a chainsaw, all of these teeth serrated around, of, around this clipial horn and around the mandibles. And I know John Latke and others have also described a couple other really exciting hell ant genera. Um, I, I just don't have them here because we didn't we didn't make models of them yet. Hopefully one day we can. Uh, and so here we can look at the homology of all these different features across these hell ant lineages. So in orange, you're seeing the mandibles. In blue, you're seeing the clipius. And then in purple is the, we're calling the frontal triangle, although it's probably not homologous with the frontal triangle that we have in other ant lineages. Um, incidentally, you know, if you're curious, we've, we've determined that this horn actually primarily derives from the clipius because in some of these species, you can actually see the tentorial pits and you can actually see the uh, sulci or the, the sutures that surround the clipial margins. And so we can actually determine that this is actually the clipius that's been drawn out into these different horn-like protrusions. Um, so using these new hell ant genera and a few other morphological characters, we reconstructed the evolutionary tree, not just of um, ants overall, but of hell ants specifically. So here you're looking at the evolutionary relationships of hell ants relative to all other stem and what we call crown or living ant genera. And so what we recover in this analysis is that hell ants are actually sister to all other living ant species, although there's some other recent work from uh, like Brendan Boudno and others that may find other results. Um, we also took these phylogenetic characters and made what we call a morphospace. So here um, we've taken the characters that we used for the head and we've used them to produce this two-dimensional plot of morphological similarity, essentially. So points that are close to each other on this plot are more morphologically similar than points that are far away. And this is really just to tell you what you could probably tell me without seeing this plot, which is that hell ant morphology, especially in the head, is very distinct. And it's much more fun to see it in uh, graphical form than on a plot, I think. And so on the top here, you're looking at seven hell ant genera, those same homologous features. And on the bottom, you're seeing some SEM images from Roberto, Roberto Keller and Alex Wild 
where I've color coded the same homologous features across those lineages. And you can see, even though modern ant morphology with respect to mouth parts and clipial uh, structure is really quite diverse, it never approaches anywhere near the, especially the um, dorsal posterior elongation that we see in hell ants. So the big question was, why is this happening? What's driving or what's making this unusual stem ant diversity? And we actually had a fossil that I think reasonably put this, gave us a very clear answer. But as we we're working on the fossil, I think a really interesting piece of evidence came from Hyphidrus aquatic beetle larva, actually. And so here's this particular beetle larva you're seeing here from the front and here from the side. And here in Hyphidrus, you can see a very similar thing where you have these scythe-like mandibles, like these little tusks, and then this elongate pedal-like horn. And in 2018, two Japanese researchers described what these hyphidrous beetle larvae use these for. And it turns out that they use them to actually dig out the soft body prey elements from ostracods. So they're essentially using the mandibles to dig into their ostracods, into the shells, and take out the parts that they can consume. So this is exciting because this is a vertical mandibular movement, which is something that we hypothesize for hell ants. Although it's actually quite common for larvae to exhibit vertical mandible uh, movement, it's much less common to see in adult um, whole metabolist insects. And we were excited about this because at the same time, we were describing this fossil specimen, which is a species of hellant ceratomyrmex, a worker who has a prey item captured around the neck. So what you're looking at on the top two images is a top-down view of ceratomyrmex and so that paddle-like horn is around the top of the pronotum of the prey item here. The prey is an extinct cockroach lineage called Caputoraptor. And then what you can't see from these top two views, but you can see on the bottom, is that the mandibles are actually on encircling the bottom side of the pronotum. So it's basically like collared. And what's especially exciting about this is this is a movement that can only be achieved by at least some, if not primarily all, uh, vertical mandible movement. So here you can see an artist's reconstruction of what this would have looked like. So to get the mandibles and the horn around the pronotum, you cannot achieve that by uh, moving your mandibles in an entirely horizontal fashion or even mostly horizontal fashion like we see in modern ants. So why is this important for what makes the diversity of hell ants? I think the story is actually kind of fun and, and makes sense in a way that uh, is especially interesting to ant scientists and myrmecologists. So we all know that Ants primarily move their mandibles in a horizontal motion, like if you're going to give somebody a hug. Um, and this is actually restricted because ants are dicondylic insects, which means there are two joints that restrict the movement in their mandibles. So if you wanna do a, a little experiment at home, you have two different types of joints in your arm. Your shoulder is monocondylic, it's one joint, and that's why you have full range of motion. And your elbow is dicondylic, which is why you cannot have full range of motion. You can only move it in one axis. And this is similar to what's happening in uh, whole metabolist monocondylic uh, mandibles. And because of that restriction of movement and this horizontal movement, it's not surprising that the variation that we see in mandible morphology really reflects how these mandibles come into contact with each other and are used to do interesting things. Um, probably the most fun example that I'm sure everybody here knows is, is thaumatomyrmex these mandibles that are used for shearing off millipede hairs. But we don't see cases where the mandibles are engaging in something else, a different structure, which is what would happen if we start to move our mandibles vertically. And I think one of the best examples for vertical mandible movement are actually vertebrate skulls. So here, I personally take it for granted that when I'm talking and chewing and biting, I'm moving my dentary, this bottom part of my um, skull against my brain case. And the top part of my, uh, of my mouth, which is my, essentially my modified brain case, and my dentary, the bottom part of my mouth, are very tightly integrated in evolutionary terms. So that's why when I bite closed, my teeth kind of fit neatly together. That's also reflected in these other organismal groups here. There's like a beaver and a moose. And I think, I think there's a bear and a cat here. So I think this is analogous to what we see in hell ants, where we have this unique evolutionary integration. We don't have the mandibles coming into contact with each other. They're coming into contact with a new structure, the head. And so that's allowing for this new adaptive space to be infiltrated. So we wanted to test this in a few different ways. 
And so one of the ways that we did that is we compared the mandible area to the clipial area in a bunch of extant ant species. So we measured um, from the, a side view the area of the clipius relative to the area of the mandibles. And here, each of these points is a species where uh, there's a unique relationship between the mandible area and the clipial area. And what you're seeing here is there really isn't a very strong relationship, and there's no statistically significant relationship. When we plot hell ants the same way, we find a very significant, highly correlated relationship um, with a very high R squared value, meaning that this would be a hallmark of evolutionary integration, that the clippius and mandibles are evolving in concert together. We thought, and also some reviewers thought, that this could be driven by sample size or, or maybe the sample scale because this is across all ants. So we also did nine other treatments, um, some cases just a specific genus of ants, in other cases um, maybe a few different ants or a whole subfamily, and in a few, at least two cases about the same sample size as what we had for hell ants, just eight or nine species. And in none of those cases did we recover slopes or our squared values that approach what we see in hell ants. So all that just to say that what I think is happening and what I think we have reasonable evidence for now is that the hell ants, mandibles and clippius are uniquely integrated because of an innovation in mandible movement. And that has allowed all of these new morphological features to emerge over time. And what's exciting about this is that we often think about adaptive radiations and things like Hawaiian honey creepers or Darwin's finches, where you have this kind of generalist ancestral form, and then there's new ecological opportunity. And so you end up evolving all of these distinct beak shapes over time. In the case of hell ants, it's exciting because it's not necessarily the case that we have evidence for new ecological opportunity in the sense of a new island, but I think it's a new mechanical shift that has allowed for that new adaptive space. And what I hope we'll find over time are other specimens of hell ants that have prey items captured. And we can see just like Darwin's finches, we have unique mandible structures that are unique to different prey items. I think that would be very exciting. This is fun also because it fits with this idea of evolutionary experiments and early burst radiations. So not just ants, but um, in arthropods in general, in the Cambrian explosion, you often have this rapid increase in anatomical diversity. And then over time, you have this effect where the really extreme versions might be lost and only the more stable and kind of evolutionary successful lineages persist over geological time. That might also be what's happening in hell ants here. Um, and so this is some work that Christine Sozak, who's a PhD student who just graduated, who's gonna graduate next week actually, has been picking up with some really exciting techniques that I'm gonna tell you about. So not only hell ants, but in general in the Cretaceous, almost all of the specimens and species that we know about are stem group ants. They belong to these linea lineages that went extinct and left no modern descendants. And if we look at all of the fossil deposits that I showed you earlier in the talk, and we put a bar graph inside where the color represents the proportion of species that are either stem ants, which is in orange, crown ants or living ants, living or modern ant lineages, which is in blue, or um, unknown in Cerdicitis, which is in, in gray here, you can see that in no case do we have more crown ant species um, in the Cretaceous than stem ant species. And we can also compare this in morpho morphospace diversity. So we've um, collected morphological data across stem and crown group lineages. And we can see this effect where we have a lot of diversity in stem ants early on. We lose that diversity just as crown or living ant um, morphological diversity really increases. So the big question is, why did stem ants succumb to extinction while crown ants continued to diversify and are so common that you can find them almost anywhere on the planet? And we think the answer to this may lie in the ecology of ants, um, including hell ants. And so because to predict the ecology of extinct species is, is not necessarily straightforward, Christine developed a machine learning framework for being able to predict the ecology of ant species based on their morphology. So she went to a few different natural history museums and took 17 ecologically relevant traits, so traits that had been proposed in the literature before and a few new ones that we think correlated with ecology. And then she compiled uh, ecological niche occupation data for each of those specimens or species. 
And those uh, data comprised foraging data, nesting data, and functional data. So where are they foraging? Where are they nesting? And what are they eating? And then she used this technique called random forest, which is a process that can help build a predictive model using those data. And so what we want to do is not only just predict living species, but predict the fossils. And so the pipeline is this. We make this model that can predict morphology, or I'm sorry, predict ecology from morphology with about 85% accuracy. We use that model then to feed in fossil data, and then we can use that to predict the ecological niche occupation of extinct species. And so here's a paper that's in revision. Um, it's almost accepted, hopefully, <laughs> um, for all of these different hellant genera and species, we predicted their foraging niche, nesting niche, and functional role using this approach. Each of those squares that you're seeing, um, there's four tiny squares inside that are different data sets, depending on what we might assume about homology um, or the completeness of data sets. And what you can see is that the foraging niche and nesting niche of hellants are frequently predicted as epigaic or ground foraging and ground nesting. Um, and often or almost entirely as either generalist or specialist predators. And this is interesting because I myself, when we first described um, Hadermarmix scimitaris, I assumed that helants would be arboreal because they were captured in amber, and they have a few different features that I thought were similar to some arboreal species. And so these, this machine learning approach is kind of contradicting my assumptions just based on looking at the fossil. And then we can use that approach to reconstruct the ecological breadth of hellants. So here, each of these cubes is a hypothetical space uh, that represents an ecological niche. So on one axis, you have nesting niche, which is in this case, just leaf litter, ground nesting, or lignocolis nesting within plant material. And then on the bottom, we have foraging niche, which is leaf litter, epigaic, or arboreal. And then on that other axis is body size. And so each of these boxes here is at least one species or specimen that occupies that unique three-dimensional niche space. And the boxes that are in hash marks there, that's our least conservative model assumption. So this is taking the reconstructions across all models and the boxes that are not hashed is just one model, which is our most conservative model. So we use this to say, here's where we think all of the ecological space that hell ants that we know about occupied. And then we can compare that to their closest living analogs, which are modern trap jaw ants. So here you're looking at um, ponerine trap jaw ants, which is Anakitis and Adonimachus, um, formicine trap jaw ants, which is Myrmeteris, uh, Stromogenes also, and then Dacetine trap jaw ants, which is on the bottom there. And you can see a really, I think, very fun thing is that hell ants fit at least one of the ecomorphological space um, occupations that you see in each of these trap jaw lineages. So another way to say that is they touch at least some of the ecomorphological space of every living trap jaw ant today. And it's even more fun when you compare the fossil, or not the fossil, the phylogenetic history of these trap jaw lineages. So on this phylogeny on the left, you can see hadomyrmicines, which is the, the uh, hell ants at the very top there. And that bar represents how long they persist in the fossil record. The other bars for ponorines, myrmicines um, that are in orange, which are stromogenes, and, and red, which are dacetine ants, those bars are placed there based on molecular divergence state estimates for when those genera emerged. And so I think it may not be a coincidence that the emergence of modern trap jaw ants is right after the KPG extinction event, in that, which is depicted in that dotted line. So it could be the case that hell ants were wiped out from the last extinction event, and that left this vacant uh, ecomorphological space that was rapidly infilled with ponorines first, which are the most diverse of these lineages, then dacetine lineages, then stromogenes, and then myrmeteris. A lot of this is speculative, but what's less speculative is the ecological breadth that we've reconstructed. I think this is a, a new approach that is uh, testing or testable and allows us to make some interesting assumptions about what extinct species actually did. So the take home here is that hell ants were the first occupants of modern trap jaw ant niche space, we think, and they were in relatively safe niche space. If they were arboreal like I and, and um, Dave Grimaldi and a few others had predicted, um, that would make a really clean explanation for why they went extinct. 
During the KPG extinction event 65 million years ago, a number of arboreal lineages went extinct, including birds. Almost all, or I think entirely all, arboreal um, bird species were wiped out during that extinction event. But in this case, that we recover them ground nest as ground nesters means that there may be something more nuanced or interesting to this story. And this is part of the work that Christine is still working on um, to try to answer that question. I have just a few minutes left, but I really want to highlight some of the work that John Pierre has been doing. Um, so I'm going to do that here. We're going to talk about an ecosystem extinction case study. So this particular case study takes us to um, the Dominican Republic and the island of Hispaniola. And the reason why we're going there is because if you look at all of those 80 fossil ant deposits where we recover fossil ant species, um, the Dominican Republic and Dominican amber is the, the second most speciose fossil deposit. So here's a plot of all of the fossil ant deposits and the number of species that are described from each. Um, this is a bit out of date though, because this is like five or six years old. Um, and so we're not the first people to recognize this as an opportunity to ask some interesting questions. Ed Wilson had a paper in Science in 1987 talking about the invasion and extinction of West Indian fauna. fauna. And what he found and reported in this uh, paper is that something like a third of all of the genera that you find in Dominican amber have gone locally extinct on the island of Hispaniola today, even though they're present in other parts of, um, of uh, Central and South America. And so to get a first picture of this, we took some morphometric data. So there's some measurements across head length and Weber's length and mandible size for um, about two thirds of the described fossil ant species and almost all of the extant um, native species on the island today. And then we use these data to produce a morphospace just through principal component um, reduction technique. And what you're seeing here is the depiction of that morphospace. So Fossil uh, phenotypes or fossil specimens are depicted in yellow and extant or living uh, species or phenotypes are in blue. And so here, again, this is a, a very severe underreporting for fossils, but we can see right off the bat that there are a number of fossil morphotypes that are present, that are no longer present on the island today. Probably the most conspicuous of these is Paraponera. So this is the only other species of Paraponera that's described. It's an extinct species from amber. And of course, there are no Paraponera on Hispaniola or the Caribbean today. Um, and these are really just a few measurements that are putting these species onto these plots. But ants are much more than just a few of these measurements. And so, you know, we wanted to also get an idea of the foraging strata or the foraging occupation of some of these fossil and living species, as well as the trophic level, what they're feeding on. And so we created three different axes that you're about to see in another cube ecomorphological space uh, plot. And so these are six binnings of body size. So from very small to very large, um, foraging macro habitat. So are they, habit are they foraging underground or all the way up into the trees? And then trophic level, are they uh, leaf cutter ants or are they only specialist predators of some um, other animals? And so we can compare the fossil and extant ecospace on this island um, using this data set, and we see that 17 um, niches are continuous, so they're found in the fossil record and they're found on the island today. Eight are on the island only today, so they're only found in extant species, although that could also be because of a sampling problem. We just don't always have a complete fossil record. Um, in fact, we, we never have a complete fossil record. And eight of these niches are entirely extinct, so they're only found in fossils and not today. And one of the most exciting of these was recently described by uh, Jem Piro just a few months ago, this paper came out. And this is the first fossil of Neoponera, which is a really exciting specimen from Dominican amber. Um, I should have mentioned also Dominican amber is dated to the Miocene about 16 million years ago. And so we CT scanned this animal and you can see the scan uh, data in the back. And then we collaborated with a very talented myrmecologist named Minsu Dong, who's an author, author on the paper, who is able to digitally fill in all of those gaps and produce what you're seeing here, which is this cool rotating three-dimensional model. Um, and Minsu actually reconstructed the iridescence of this animal. So um, Jempiro noted early on that, hey, this is actually iridescent, just like modern Neoponera, many modern Neoponera are. And so Minsu was able to overlay that onto this uh, reconstruction, which is exciting. And I'm not always the most 
um, scientific thinker. And the first thing I thought when I saw the specimen was, this is really big. <laughs> it's a really big animal, um, especially for a fossil from this region. So what we did is we took measurements for all of these different predatory ants on the island today and in the fossil record. And we distilled those into one principal component axis that reflected size. And what you're seeing here is kind of a histogram distribution of all of the different species on the island today, which is in gray, and in the fossil record, which is in yellow. And what you can see immediately is that this new fossil species of Neoponera is much larger. In fact, it's a third larger than any other living um, predator ant species on the island. And in fact, it's not the only one. There are three other species that are either described or that we are aware of that we're soon to be describing that are also larger than any of the species that we find today. So this is just one piece of evidence that suggests that this one particular niche of very large specialist predators has gone extinct on the island. And of course, this is one of what we now know is about 115 species in the fossil record. And each of those we think has an interesting story to tell us about the history of life on this island. So just to summarize again, um, extinction is often viewed as something that is happens but is incidental, but it actually, including extinction and thinking about extinction can dramatically reshape the way that reconstruct, we reconstruct the history of life on our planet. And we learn about extinction through fossils. And I think we're very lucky that we have such a rich fossil record um, in ants. Uh, although we can ask a number of really interesting questions, of course, even in groups that don't have a fossil record. Um, I hope that if you hadn't thought about fossils before, maybe they're a little bit more interesting or important to you now, um, because I know there are many talented scientists on this call, and many of them are already contributing to paleomarmacology, but there's plenty of room for many more exciting contributions. So with all that said, I'd like to thank all of the people on this screen. And again, thank you very much for the invitation. As I said, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I just kept scrolling and scrolling through the program, just the breadth of, of talks that are coming up and posters is so exciting. Um, and so again, I, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all. Thank you. All right, thanks a ton, Phil, for that amazing talk. Muchas gracias, Phil, por esa charla tan entretenida. Eh, estamos un poquitico sobre el tiempo, eh, pero si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, creo que tengo una pregunta acá en el, en el chat de YouTube, el cual es, uh, super interesting, congratulations, the part of artificial intelligence to make these copies. Was there any help with people specialized in this matter? So the funny thing about the art, so it's a little bit less artificial intelligence, but it is machine learning. But it's it, it's not actually a fancy technique. This has been around since like the 90s, the 1990s, but has really hasn't been used by paleontologists yet. It's just been used by computer scientists. And so we talked to one person in our department who happens to work on ants, Simone Garnier, who knows about statistics broadly, and he recommended this approach. But other than that, there's such a rich literature and sort of guiding set of documents for how to use this software and these approaches that that we um, I should say Christine did almost all the work also. So I, I, for me, it felt very easy, but <laughs> that's probably because she was the one actually doing all the programming. Alguno tiene alguna pregunta? I think no one else is asking any questions. All right. Listo. Entonces, de nuevo, muchas gracias, eh, doctor Phil Barden, por, por esta charla tan interesante. Eh, ahora vamos a dar un, el paso a, al break. Vamos a dar un breve descanso de más o menos 15 minutos hasta las, hasta las eh, 9.45, 9.50. Entonces, por favor, conéctense a las 9.45 para, para seguir con la siguiente ronda de, de charlas. Thanks again, Phil. Thank you.